Hello and welcome into the Free Outside Podcast. Bozeman is super busy right now and I'm in the midst of 20 hours a week of running plus a couple hours of strength training and stuff on top of that. So we're just running ragged out here. That's on top of like all the normal work stuff and everything. So basically social life is gone and it's probably good. It keeps me out of trouble. Anyways, on this episode of the Free Outside Podcast, I wanted to dive into two different topics and just see where that puts us for a show. Sorry, Bozeman is so loud right now. Hopefully none of these sounds are coming through. That was just a motorcycle that went by. But I want to dive into two different things that are pretty interesting to me and seem to be interesting to other people because they ask about them a lot. The first one I'm going to get into is training philosophy, training plans, training theory, how it all works, how it's fit into me setting, I don't know, 20 records, 10 of them, notable, top five FKT of the year, a couple different times across the last five years. See how that all plays in, how it all adds up, how training theory works, and if you don't want to coach or just want to know how to make sense of your own training plans, maybe this will be a good toolkit or if you just want to get into shape it'll give some basic philosophies and I love this stuff I read a bunch of studies on training well studies mostly on different experiment experiments and I don't know hypotheses that come out I really like PubMed lots of science I've been really getting into the sauna science and heat training and especially cold plunges which I think there are definitely pros and cons to cold plunges, so anyone who thinks that they are just the best thing ever, uh, I disagree. Um, I guess we could just get into it right now. Um, All right, we'll put a pin in it. The other topic I want to get into is I got this message on Instagram from Ben Stone. Hopefully you don't care if I say say your name. Said you've been listening, you're a sophomore in college, running track, studying psychology, and... Do, 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 do. Moving on. I was wondering how you found your path in life, purpose slash career. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with my life and I'm looking for some advice. So I thought I would spend the back half of the podcast talking about how I found my career path. If you want to call it a career. I mean, I feel like I work like 80 hours a week, but I love every minute of it and having part of it be learning about both training psychology and training theory and also putting that into practice and then working with athletes myself, along with writing, all kinds of stuff like that, learning how to market, all that. I feel like I really enjoy the career. Some of it sucks, but let's get into that in the second half. All right, let's go back to this first part, a broad overview of training theory, philosophy, how it works, and kind of how you want to attack things. (laughs) All right, let's start with the cold plunge. I think cold plunge can be really good for recovery, but I also think it makes you skip a couple steps. What I mean with this is, let's say I had a hard gym workout this morning, and obviously I want those gains to to hit me, to uh, sink in. I want to benefit from those. Or let's say I did an interval workout this morning. What's going to feel good? A cold plunge. But what is also going to jump two steps of recovery? or lessen inflammation, a cold plunge. And that's not what you want to do. Inflammation is a normal part of the recovery process. And there are some pretty good studies out there that show that just simply cold plunging to recover means that you're not getting the full benefit of those workouts. Like you're pushing your body, you're like speeding through the recovery process. And in that recovery process is where you build up those gains through obviously like protein and things like that. And there are numbers you can hit with all that to maximize the gains. But simply in a nutshell, if we're doing this in a silo, take everything else out. Cold plunging can be really good for maybe being the most prepared for your long days, maybe being recovered or helping with the taper week or something where you're not looking for recent gains or recent workouts to really sink in. If you're not building, then If you're not building, but you're maintaining or you're trying to recover, I think a cold plunge can serve a good purpose in lessening inflammation, sometimes increasing blood flow, 
But on the flip side, I think sauna work has very few drawbacks other than, of course, dehydration and things like that. But as far as like increased blood volume and clean, yeah, I can't talk, increased hemoglobin, everything like that, sauna is good. Cold plunge depends on the situation. Okay, training theory. This is how I've always done it. So before I even knew anything about it, uh, let's just go back to 2011. I threw hike the Pacific Crest Trail. I like ran a little bit. I was in very general shape from just playing basketball in um, college, just uh, really hooping around in the rec center. And then I went and through hiked. I'd done a marathon at this point, a couple half marathons and through hiked. I didn't do any real training. Fast forward to let's go to 2018. This is when I really started thinking that I'd figured out what to do. So by happen chance, I just I did the Great Western Loop and I got to Colorado. So I'd done like, let's say, 5,000 miles at this point. These are 5,000 miles of what we call zone one out of, uh, it's called a five, let's do the five zone model. There's a three zone model. So zone one is the lowest zone. It's where your heart is working the least hard. So basically every single day for, let's call it 10 hours a day, I would walk, I would hike. So I hiked 5,000 miles, all pretty much, probably 98% of it is in that zone that's the least intensive heart rate, the least intensive effort level. And I got to around Tennessee Pass, and this is when I decided to do Nolan's 14. So I was going to attack this Ultra Runners Challenge. So you have to do 100 miles in 60 hours, and there's like 50,000 feet of gain or something. Most of it's off trail. In that, you're above 10,000 feet nearly the entire time, and you summit 14 different 14,000 foot peaks. So it was really an experiment without even knowing it, but in hindsight, it's that um, experiment one of one and of one. So I was the only participant in the study, but seeing if zero speed work, zero, basically intervals, zero aerobic capacity work, zero VO2 max, zero threshold work, zero, anything that would point to training theory could translate into accomplishing this ultra runners challenge that some of the best of the best ultra runners haven't even been able to accomplish. And their typical weeks, especially back then, were like Saturday, Sunday long run, maybe Tuesday workout, Wednesday or Thursday workout and fill in some easy runs. So they had very regimented styles that were built to push up that VO2 max and then that threshold pace and then that aerobic efficiency. All I'd done is learn how to, I'd molded my body to be able to move in that zone one and had that low intensity, but able to move all day efficiently. So I did this challenge. I learned about sleep deprivation. I had so much adrenaline hit. I ran down some of the mountains. It was really cool, actually. I really enjoyed it. And then I was immersed in it. It was like, so 60 hours, two and a half days. And with one peak to go, I could see like the top of Tabaguash and Shivana, which are the last two peaks. So I'd done 12 of the 14 14ers. And that's when the first time I had this adrenaline hit of like, I only have maybe it was three hours or two and a half hours and I got to get all the way up there. And it surged through me and every step I just had this level of effort and this surging motivation through me that I'd never felt before. I got to the top, it was able to run all the way down to the bottom did it. It was like 59 hours and 33 minutes. And that was the first thing that showed me that I could do some of these FKTs. And then looking back and in hindsight, as I move forward, this also showed me that so much of this work in that level that you want to be at. So when you're doing something for 60 hours, you're going to want to be in that lower effort level as much as you can be. This can translate directly to ultra marathons. It can be translate directly to your own running, to anything out there, that level that's going to have the least impact on the body, but the most benefit is really that zone one, that lowest level of effort. And it also, I still had the ability to push hard, run down, nearly sprinting down Shivano and Tabaguash at the end, even without having done any hill strides or sprints. So this is different than like what I would coach now, but I think it really showed that you can't really overdo it in that easiest realm. So if you're just somebody listening that just wants to get into good shape, do basically everything in that easiest zone. It doesn't matter how slow you look on Strava. And the other thing to throw in there now, I think, is just sprinting like 
I heard this one funny interview. It was like, if you're going to do one workout a week, walk around like nothing's happening for 20 minutes. And then the last minute, pretend like a bear is chasing you and sprint. And that's basically what you need to do if you want to get all sides of fitness in the least amount of time is spend like most of your time at that Z1 effort level and then some of it pushing really hard. So let's translate this into regular training theory and how I coach. So not everyone is going to have 10 hours per day, seven days a week. In fact, pretty much nobody, no one that has time for coaching is going to have that much time for training. So how I boil it down now, and especially with athletes attacking different things, especially the longer things is so a mid distance thing, let's say like a 50 K a 50 kilometer race, 31 miles. I would say how I'd break it down is 70% of the effort would be in that zone one, that really easy zone where you could hold a conversation. This is like when you go out with a, on a run with friends or a hike up a hill or something where you could talk the whole time or most of the time, that's where you want to live. Even if you do one run a week, just apply these same percents. So 70%, if you're doing something kind of that marathon level distance, 70% in that pretty easy zone. And then probably like 10%, I don't know, 10 to 15, 10 to 20, depending on where you at, it, you are at in that little bit harder zone. This is where we like to call them strides in the, in the biz, but it doesn't really matter. Strides. So basically what you're doing is you're ramping up and you're getting that biomechanical motion and that form and that push. So you're just letting your body experience going faster. It's feeling it, but you're not keeping it at that level for very long. This might be six by 30 second strides. It might be eight by one minute, something like that. And then within that, that's when you can have those workouts that are a little bit different. Maybe you're pushing like three by three by two minutes or something like that, or five by two minutes. These little two minute periods, these are for your heart rate. These are where you're getting your VO2 max up. You're improving things. So you're trying to get your fitness, which is VO2 max is basically the peak of your fitness. It's how much oxygen you can use. Um, and especially your VVO2 max is like your velocity at your VO2 max. So you're trying to get all of these things to come together and you can raise that VO2 max by these little bit longer workouts and strides. Strides are mostly biomechanical. They unlock the ability for your body to move that fast. And then these VO2 max workouts, they help raise the ceiling of where your VO2 max is. And then once you get your VO2 max to wherever you get it, that's when you can build under that with some of these workouts in that like 15 to 20% of your week type of thing where you're in that zone that's higher than easy, but it's lower than hard. And these are where you're starting to push up towards that VO2 max. So you're letting your body learn to push up towards that. You're working on recovery in there. So these might be threshold workouts or steady state runs, things kind of in that middle zone. So it's like, think of it as three types of workouts. You have the going really fast and you have the going really slow and you have this weird middle zone. And the middle zone is what most people mess with throughout training the most. Like you can do more of a threshold block. You can do more of a VO2 max block, but either way it's, unless you're using heart rate, these are going to be pretty intertwined because you can't necessarily sprint for uh, more than, I don't know, I guess we just watched the Olympics like 40 seconds or slow. So and then how does this apply to the greater, the grand scheme of things? So really, how would I say in my mind, it's like a pyramid, but I don't think I can translate this. This is like the autisticness in me coming out. Also, my brain is always consumed by numbers. That's what I think in pictures and numbers. So a pyramid with a bunch of numbers, but let me try to put this in words. So it goes from least specific to most specific. Let's just, let's start with this framework. That's pretty common. Um, so the furthest out from the event, you can work on anything but ideally it would be this like your your weaknesses that you're going to work on um the least specific things maybe it's like flat speed even if you're doing a mountain race it can be raising that vo2 max since you won't be doing let's take a 100 miler if it's a 100 miler mountainous race then you can raise that vo2 max you can raise that flat ground speed you can even raise that threshold pace you could heck you could even work on your 5k speed the furthest out from that race is when that's going to be the most productive time 
And then you can carry that as you get more specific. So you go least specific to most specific, pretty simple. So um, I like to work with athletes. Usually you make sure they have a good enough base. And then I like to work right into a VO2 max build where one to two workouts a week, you're working on building that VO2 max. You're pushing that speed as high as it can go. And this is assuming they have a race that they will not be sprinting much in. And then after like that VO2 max block, how you usually move into a threshold block. So threshold is, so you have VO2 max is the highest level. Threshold is going to be that next level. And then under that, you have like steady state runs or endurance runs. But threshold can push almost up to VO2 max if you train it. So you build your VO2 max as high as you can. And then you work on this threshold level. Threshold's basically what you could hold for, say, like an hour. Think like your 10K pace, maybe just slightly slower, uh, depending on if it's an all-out 10K. But just start with your 10K pace for your threshold pace. And you can get that pace fairly close to VO2 max. This isn't a pace you could hold for an whole, a whole ultra or anything, but this will translate into that ability to bounce back, recover, that ability to push down hills, that heart rate, and it'll just lengthen that heart rate zone. So the higher your VO2 max, the higher your max heart rate, which makes, and then if you work on your threshold, the higher your threshold heart rate, which means that the higher your like aerobic zone or Z1 or Z2 zones as well. So you're just lengthening that width of where your heart's going to be in an ultra, your heart rate is going to be in an ultra. And that's the entire point of working on things in that bottom down approach. And then in that last phase, which is usually the longest, I like to make it the longest is the endurance build, or I call it endurance build because most athletes I coach are doing an endurance based event. This is that very specific. So you've worked, gone least specific VO2 max and you end up in most specific where maybe you're working on hills. If it's a hilly hundred, you're working on longer runs, you're working on nutrition, you're working on things like that. But the one thing that so that was the general framework of what most coaches do. I think it's fairly similar and accepted across the board. It's called block periodization. Each block is like the O2 max block, threshold block, endurance block, so on and so forth. But what I like to do, which is slightly different, is a lot of coaches make a schedule like, let's say, in the VO2 max block. You have a workout maybe Monday and Thursday, Monday, Friday, and then a long run Sunday. But then you have a bunch of these junk miles in between, and I'm not a fan of junk miles. I think there is so much benefit in each of them. So I like to assign different priorities to each of them. So maybe one is, um, let's do like maybe finding like a hiking pace or a nutrition base or hydration based or working with poles or... Um, carrying your pack, deciding on gear. Like, I think there's so many benefits you can attach to these junk miles that they become not junk miles. It's like move at race effort with your poles so that you're starting to internalize and know how to use those poles. Or try to do this 90-minute run at race effort, but do it at night so you can practice with a headlamp. So I think I'm really big on hitting all the specifics and preparing for all the things that can happen out there. So that's sort of how I attack and use nutrition lists and uh, working on things like night or finding forever pace, I think is a huge thing. Working with poles, vert based, things like that. I think that's a huge thing. The other thing I like to do is continue to recycle strides. So lots of athletes, when I start working with them, they love that strides are in there and get to sprint or pretty much sprint. You're like 90 to 95% of what your true all out running from a bear would be, but it's really fun to get to move that way. And lots of athletes, if they're running ultras, haven't done that in a long time. So I like to recycle them every couple of weeks, two or three weeks, just to continue to get that back in there. It's fun. It's really good biomechanically and just helps improve and keep things engaged. And it's pretty fun to just tack on to the end of like a 30 minute run with some strides. So that's basic training philosophy. If you're coaching yourself, least specific to most specific Build your VO2 max, build your threshold up into that, and then figure out where your endurance aerobic zone is going to be after that for your given race and go from there. All right, now let's get into this other question that we had. Um, so I dream of running ultra marathon soon after I graduate. Okay, I kind of gave a training plan. I guess we're doing, we can call this the Ben Stone episode. Haven't met you. 
I you're still in my message request. So hopefully this is a fun uh, episode for you to listen to. If you guys want, you can write in. I'm happy to answer anything and everything. I was going to start sharing some more studies because I probably read like eight to, t I probably read like two a day or at least skim two a day, maybe dive deeper on one of them a day because I just love new science that's coming out and God bless my girlfriend for just putting up with some of my texts about uh, different things from studies and I don't think she really cares about them, but I find them interesting, especially when it's numbers uh, resulting to, I don't know, net gains or uh, protein synthesized or protein consumed is a big one, salt, changes like that, sweat rate, all kinds of stuff. I just find it all fascinating. And if there's numbers that come out of it, that's when I text my girlfriend who I don't think cares as much about numbers as me, but that's probably part of my autistic leanings. All right. So I dream of running ultras. We got through that, I think, in some way. We can always follow up with more episodes, but I like to keep these solo ones short because, I don't know, it's just me talking to me. I don't know how many people I'm reaching. Actually, I do. The stats are really good. You guys are awesome. Really would love as many five-star reviews as we can get. Okay, wondering how I found my path in life, purpose, career. Okay, so I quit college to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. I didn't want to go back to college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew if I went back, I would be wasting my time. But in the end, I didn't really know what option to take. So I went back, finished college, ended up with student loans through hike the Pacific Northwest Trail. Right after that, there's actually an episode on my kind of more life story. I think it's called The Pursuit of Happiness, if you want to look for that. I should number these, but I never will because I never started to. But how I found my life purpose is I just started broad. This, I think, applies to anything. You don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up when you're five. I always wanted to be an athlete. I didn't know how I would get there. I didn't really even like running. I got bull bullied in cross country as a freshman and sophomore. I'm like the only kid that ever got bullied in cross country, but maybe, I don't know. I'm sure there's actually more. It's kind of brutal. I won't name names, but the kids a year older were mean to me. So I didn't like running for a while. I didn't know that through hiking would lead me back to running, but as I really grew to enjoy through hiking, I think because the quietness around me, it calmed my anxiety. I trusted moose, bears, the woods more than I trust society and interpersonal reactions. I could just walk as me out there. Everything was, it felt controlled to me. Like a problem would present itself. Only I could solve it. It wasn't like a bear was going to pop up and help me solve it. It was just like calming to know that problems I could never think of might come up, but I didn't have to rely on someone else. I could rely on myself and I still maintain a hundred percent self extraction rate. Anyways, moving into how I found my career is I just, I went back to college and got a degree in business. I found the most broad thing that I figured I could maybe work in the outdoor industry. I got a minor in outdoor recreation management. I learned about trail building. I thought, Hey, maybe this is like that one little thing in some job interview with an outdoor company that may get me in the door and move things further along. I also in this time found that I really liked having fun. Like Internally, I was going to push myself harder than anyone. I get obsessed with things. I, yeah, I picked up 6,000 pine cones just to have my parents buy me a unicycle. They said, penny a pine cone. And so 6,000 is 60 bucks. And that's how much a unicycle cost in 1998 or whatever. So that's how driven I am, even as that would have been like an eight or nine year old. But I think, so I, graduated college. I was driven to work in the outdoors, but I just knew, I don't know. I needed to pr continue to progress forward and then just keep it as broad as I could and figure it out from there. So I interviewed with a few companies in Denver. I visited a friend in Denver, saw that it was sunny in the winter and then I was happier and then I was less depressed. And it was like, oh wow, it's not just like slate gray, like the Pacific Northwest all winter everywhere. So I moved out there, got a degree or got a job in uh, small business consulting where I basically worked as a contract CFO, contract controller for a bunch of businesses. And I took this very intentionally 
knowing it would give me exposure to a bunch of industries. Maybe there was an industry out there I loved, but I didn't know yet. So I wanted to move into this field, this career without or with the ability to get exposure before going super niche. I don't know. It seemed like if I picked, because I got offered a couple other jobs that were more like on the accounting side of, I don't know, a certain, maybe one was like a solar panel company. I can't remember the other one. But it was like, if I work in this industry, I don't think I can get broader and just jump over to something else. So I figured I would take this job with exposure to multiple different companies and just see where it went. Didn't like that job. After like 18 months, quit, knew that I still loved nature. I sold my car, did the calendar year triple crown and didn't really know where life was going to go. But I knew where I was wasn't the path I wanted to take. So I wasn't afraid to quit my job. The landing wasn't really going to be that soft or anything, but I just knew in my heart what I wanted to do was a calendar year triple crown. I also knew I could figure it out. I was scrappy. I could be frugal, et cetera. There's a ton of options if you look around more than any time in history. So I quit. I did the calendar year triple crown, finished that. And this is when, I don't know, I started piecing it together. I started reaching out to, I decided like, oh, maybe I can write in the outdoor industry. So I started trying out a bunch of things, throwing things at the wall. I, in my mind, since I always think in pictures, um, I imagine a wall full of like, for some reason it's baloney, but like some of it has stuck to the wall and some of it hasn't. So every time someone says like, throw things at the wall and see what sticks in my mind, the visual is literally a wall full of baloney. Some of it's like gross and sweaty and stuff. But I just started throwing things at the wall. So I did some public speaking. I set some up. I got like a four-figure gig down in Auburn where I did a whole presentation and that worked really good. With that, I had enough money I could buy a laptop because I'd literally sold everything to do the calendar year Triple Crown. When I go all in, I go all in. I got reoccurring writing work from Digital Trends. It did not pay good. Let's say like 70 or 80 bucks an article. It paid terrible. Right now, most offers I get are for a dollar a word or so. But... Um, back then it was like, this will think of it like a resume. Like I need to have on there that I've done public speaking. I've done events, I've done writing and I've done the actual event of through hiking. I've done the calendar year triple crown. So I've done some podcasts. I have articles written about me. I need to show that I am well-rounded back then. I thought the Avenue was going to be sponsorship. So what are you bringing to a sponsor? One, you could bring your audience. Two, you could bring your, well, actually your accomplishments will never matter. I know it's weird. I'm going to come back to that in a second, but you can bring your audience. You can bring um, projects that you're doing. You can bring opportunities or events. You can bring resources. You can bring knowledge, uh, like collaborating on um, shoes or technology or testing things out. I actually work with a lot of brands and I basically they'll send me a prototype. I'll destroy it, give them feedback and help make multiple things together like that. So you can bring all these sorts of things. There's all these avenues to work with brands, even on the athlete side, if you want. But number one, what you can't bring to a brand is stuff you've already done. Like I can't go to a brand today and say, I've done the calendar year triple crown. You should sponsor me because what does that mean? Like I didn't whether I did or didn't wear their shoes in 2016, it doesn't matter. It's not going to help them sell those shoes today. Those aren't even models that they have anymore. Like it might be a connection of, oh, I've worn your shoes for this long or, oh, I can tell your story or, um, oh, I want to make a movie about this upcoming thing that features the calendar year triple crown. But very little that you've done in the past is going to help a company sell stuff in the future. And what does a company need to do? Sell stuff to survive. So how can you be a professional athlete? It's about how can you help them sell stuff. Now, there's so many aspects to helping sell. Maybe you don't know the first thing about marketing. Maybe you don't have an audience, but you can have like a human impact study story. Like maybe it's your, let's go back to uh, Ben here. It's your first trail race. Maybe there's a one, the best way to get in with a brand is a one-off project. So you can be like a one-off project. I'm going to go after this FKT. I'm going to go after this trail race. You can work reach out to a small brand or something. And maybe the best way to do it is there's some budget, some videographer who's going to help you do it, or they're just going to help you with some gear, a little bit of travel expenses or something, or 
get into the race even, and then there's like some something that comes out of it. Maybe maybe it's a video, maybe it's some photos, maybe it's an article, maybe you just write a race recap or an FKT recap or write about what you learned or something. But there's it's got to be a two-way street of what's going to help them and how you could be helping them there is showing a real person using it. You're personifying their brand, you're showing their values, their characteristics, and that's going to connect with people who are going to connect on a deeper level than that they have, let's say, good shoes, and that's going to help them sell shoes. So that's a little bit deeper way to help them sell shoes. Let's say you build up a 10,000 person audience. That's a pretty good way, especially if your engagement's really high or click-through rate on these things. Maybe you have a website, maybe you're really good at writing and you can get in with different places like that. Like that's another aspect of like a race recap where you feature something. I know um, like Reed Burroughs, I believe he doesn't have a very big audience. I don't know that he's really had any crazy good race results or anything, but he's gotten him with the, uh, I think trail runner magazine or a few different publications just with his writing. So that's a really good avenue and aspect. And if you can tell your story in a way that's relatable to the masses, the masses meaning consumers, not just like I'm an elite, look how good I am, look how much I train. If you can write it in a way that's relatable and connects back to a brand, you're a lot more likely to get sponsored. And then another avenue and an aspect I think is presence, race presence. So let's say you're a really good runner. You don't have an audience you're not a very good writer. You don't want to write. You don't know the first thing about making a reel. It's hard to connect with brands. The other thing you can do is interpersonal. Like, let's say an Era Viper race. You Let's say you go win. I was just at Tushers. Let's say you just you win Tushers. A really important and impactful thing you can do is stick around, chat with people at the finish line, cheer for the runners going in and have a presence that's interpersonal. You're building interpersonal relationships with people. Then they know you, they trust you more. They're already impressed that you finished like eight hours ago and you've stuck around to cheer in the last finisher. You talked to Era Vipa. I mean, that company has connections. It's all about who you know. So even that person that finishes 52nd and you cheered for them and you say hi after and get to know them, that can have as big of an impact on your career as having 15,000 followers. So this most underrated and overlooked thing by I think a lot of elites is this giving back. Maybe it's going and volunteering at a race and that can even be good for learning how to race or just sticking around and cheering for people, showing that you don't, that you value everyone else out there. There's a few people who've complained about sponsorships lately and have to, having been at races they've been at, they just leave when they're done. And that shows so little value for the community and the other people. And even if they are good people, it just comes across as they don't care. So hopefully these are some good tips on how to get into this career, how to figure it out. There's no one size fits all one way to do it. I think you just have to value the connections, the people and have a purpose with approaching a brand. You can't just be like, look how fast I am or look how fast I was. It's got to be like, look at my plan, look at what I'm going to do in the future, look how I'm going to do it, and I would love for you to be a part of it with me. Everything I did, probably 30, 30 to $40,000 worth of my own travel, FKTs, everything was self-funded before I really got any sponsorship, commitment, anything. And now I sometimes get companies reaching out about prototypes or to try things out. And I think of it as that investment in myself, all that money I put towards going after my stuff when I approached brands and they just didn't want to work together, that showed that I was still going to do it and I was going to follow through on myself, whether the brand was there or not. And I think that's just as important as your path should not be dictated if a brand's on board with you, but you should be approaching brands to come on the ride with you. So don't dictate your plans or your future by what brands want but invite brands along for your journey. Okay, I think that was a lot of rambling, but I hope that there's some value there. Um, yeah, five-star reviews. Uh, give a five-star review and leave a comment if you can on Apple Podcasts. Leave like a funny one. Try to write in Pig Latin or something. All right, value you all. We are crushing this podcast. I really should start a Patreon or something, but I love doing this. Thanks again, guys. And until next time, Stay 
elite, my friends. 